Hello, welcome to lecture 11 of this course. This is lecture number 1 of module 4. In this lecture, we will discuss some applications of quantum entanglement. However, before I do that, in continuation with the previous class on quantum entanglement measure, in this lecture, I will discuss very briefly about continuous variable entanglement. So let's begin. In the last two classes, we have discussed quantum entanglement measures in the context of discrete variables. Discrete variable systems such as spin half systems are a bit difficult to realize experimentally for quantum information science applications. On the other hand, continuous variable systems are pretty easy to realize experimentally or handle experimentally. However, there are difficult issues involved with continuous variable systems. Uh, we know that the dimension of Hilbert space is infinite uh, for continuous variable system and some uh, examples of continuous uh, variable systems are say quantized electromagnetic fields uh, when quantized uh, you know electromagnetic fields act like a harmonic uh, act like a collection of infinite independent harmonic oscillators having amplitude and phase quadrature as its variables then we have vibrational degrees of freedom of trapped ions you know trapped ion is one of the prominent candidate uh, for quantum computer then we have nanomechanical oscillators then state of cold atom gas and so on now as regards entanglement in continuous variable regime is concerned uh, so far what we have seen is that most quantum information theory has been formulated in the context of finite dimensional Hilbert space. Uh, but uh, there arises many problems if we extend it to continuous variable system. One problem is that uh, there are many issues. Some of the prominent ones are that the dimension of the Hilbert space here in continuous variable uh, system is infinite as I said and uh, as a result we have states with an infinite amount of entanglement and this should not surprise you because in an earlier class i told that the entropy of entanglement for a maximally entangled state in d dimensional hilbert space is log d and now we are we have to deal with infinite dimensional hilbert space right uh, but what is more troublesome is that the set of pure states with infinite entropy of entanglement is actually dense in trace norm on the set of pure state. It's basically a bit technical, but the point here is that this basically means that the arbitrarily close to any product state is a state which has infinite entanglement. So this is uh, basically forbids us to uh, develop uh, and quantum entanglement measures in the context of uh, you know continuous variable and uh, variable uh, system but there the people have suggested some solution and maybe it is some of the solution would be that okay consider only states where the mean energy is bounded from above and this is a reasonable uh, physical assumption and and on this subset of states the entropy of entanglement is continuous other measures can also be defined on this subset without exhibiting any strange behavior now i will not go into much of technical details here but i will just mention one uh, continuous variable criterion uh, which is related to the so-called epr paradox and this criterion is called duan criterion and this criterion is a sufficient criterion for inseparability for continuous variable system. So let us discuss it uh, briefly. And in EPR thought experiment, Einstein, Podolsky and Rosen considered a pair of particles 1 and 2 created at some point at some time moment so that conservation of momentum led to the equation x1 minus x2 is equal to constant or and p1 plus p2 is equal to constant or one may also get x1 plus x2 is equal to constant and p1 minus p2 is equal to constant in this first case here this implies that the position variables the position variables are co uh, are correlated 
and these particular uh, these relations we have uh, discussed in an earlier class on EPR paradox here positions vari variables are correlated and momentum variables momenta momenta are anti correlated on the other hand in this case here also we may get the opposite thing where uh, positions position uh, our positions are anti correlated anti correlated and momenta are momenta are correlated all right now taking uh, the idea from uh, epr experiment duan introduced two epr like continuous variable operators u and v u is equal to mod a x1 plus 1 by a x2 and v is equal to mod a p1 minus 1 by a p2 where a is an arbitrary non-zero real number and this position variable and the momentum variable has to satisfy this commutator here uh, we take generally h cross is equal to 1 which is in the natural unit and a is equal to 1 for maximally for maximally entangled state maximally entangled or correlated state correlated state and in that case you will get u is equal to x1 plus x2 and v is equal to p1 minus p2 okay so duan worked out a separability criterion uh, based on these uh, two operators for a quantum state row representing a continuous variable system and he found that uh, the variance in u that is delta u square and variance in v that is delta v square is less than a square plus 1 by a square where delta u is the variance in u and it's defined as uh, it is the expectation value of u square uh, calculated uh, for the uh, state rho minus expectation square of the expectation value of u, u and delta v square is similarly the expectation value of v square minus square of the expectation value of v and for a maximally for a maximally entangled state for a maximally entangled state uh, this criterion the total variance delta u square plus delta v square which is in short denoted by this symbol capital d uh, is less than 2 and if that means if this quantity capital D is less than 2 this implies the continuous variable state the continuous variable state is entangled is entangled let me now make a useful comment uh, as a reminder to you as we are talking about variances you know the famous heisenberg uncertainty principle has this form delta x delta px is greater than or equal to h cross by 2 where h cross is the uh, reduced Planck's constant this we can write in terms of variance in this form delta x square delta px square is greater than or equal to h cross square by 4. Sometimes people write uh, this expression in this form as well. Variance var variance of x into variance of p of x is greater than or equal to h cross by 4. Uh, in fact, uh, you know that any uh, variable, any set of variable x and y, if it satisfies this commutation relation, x, y is equal to i, h cross, then you can write a 
uncertainty relation for uh, these two set of variables x and y. Here, as regards Duan criterion is concerned, I have given you a prescription only without going into any technical details. In fact, I have not even derived the Duan criterion, which is too complicated and this is beyond the scope of our work also. But uh, if I, uh, if time permits, uh, in a later class, I will focus exclusively on continuous variable entanglement. However, you can consider that as extra material only and it is not going to be part of your exam. I will now discuss how quantum entanglement can be useful for the realization of so-called super dense coding. In the next lecture, I will discuss quantum teleportation, which is somewhat analogous to super dense coding. However, before I discuss that, uh, we will need some concept and ideas. One such concept is the so-called no cloning theorem. So let us discuss it first. No cloning theorem is of paramount importance in quantum information science. No cloning theorem says that it is not possible it's not possible to clone or copy an arbitrary arbitrary means unknown that is unknown quantum state quantum state by unitary transformation by unitary transformation so this is the no cloning theorem and by now all of you know what is called unitary transformation now as per no cloning theorem it is not possible to clone or copy an unknown or arbitrary quantum state let us prove it in order to prove it let me uh, you know first explain uh, what we mean by cloning cloning basically requires that you find an uh, unitary transformation u such that suppose you have a state k psi and you want to copy it to an empty state represented by this say blank state 0 k 0 and uh, having uh, doing cloning means that by this unitary transformation you can write this k psi into this blank state okay so this is what we mean by uh, cloning and no cloning theorem says that no such unitary transformation so it says that such u does not exist as per no cloning theorem in order to prove that let us do assume the opposite thing the contrary thing that means let us assume assume that sas u exist okay then what is going to happen suppose you have a two state arbitrary state to linearly independent quantum state say you have psi k psi and k phi are two linearly independent uh, state and you have this unitary transformation by which you can copy this state psi to the blank state uh, u empty state u so because of this you are going to get k psi direct product k psi and in this case the other case you can copy k phi to the empty state or the blank state and you will get k phi tensor product k phi okay now again as i said ki this k psi and k phi are linearly independent so we can have a superposition state say a k psi plus uh, b k phi and this state also if such unitary transformation exists i can copy it to the blank state so if i do that uh, if we can do that then this will give us say because of the linearity let me just write you will get a u k psi direct product k zero plus 
B unitary operator applied on gate 5 direct product or tensor product 0 and because of this unitary operation you will get A gate psi direct product gate psi plus B gate phi direct product gate phi okay so this is what you will get let me say this is my equation number one but you see if there is transformation you can clone arbitrary states it should give for any arbitrary a and b you should be able to uh, write a say k psi plus b k phi then if i i can copy this to the, the whole state this whole thing i can copy to the blank state that means i will get a k psi plus b k phi uh, direct product or tensor product a k psi plus b k phi right and if i now open it up then i am going to get a square k psi direct product k psi plus b square k phi uh, direct product k phi plus a b k psi direct product k phi plus a b direct product phi uh, direct product of k phi and k psi so you will get this uh, let us say this is my equation number two now if you look at equation one and equation two what you see is that they are different unless a and b a or b is zero so clearly the transformation uh, u does not exist so equation one and two implies u does not exist because a or b has to be equal to zero and then the whole thing would have no meaning at all so no cloning theorem says that we cannot clone any arbitrary state such as say a k0 plus b k1 where a and uh, b are arbitrary these kind of states cannot be cloned however there is a loophole and the loophole says that the theorem the theorem does not apply theorem does not apply if the states to be cloned if the states to be cloned are limited to are limited to k0 and k1 because the arbitrariness would not be there in that case if we know that it is k0 and k1 and this is the reason why we have unitary transformation uh, operations where we can go from k one zero to k one one you may recall that this we can achieve by the so called c not gate operation right so this is possible and in this case the no cloning theorem does not apply and uh, this is uh, this fact is actually exploited to construct quantum error correcting codes so if the data under consideration are limited to k0 and k1 we can copy qubit states even in a quantum computer now we'll discuss our first application of quantum entanglement we'll discuss super dense coding or simply called dense coding it is a procedure to allow someone say alice to send two classical bits to another party say bob by using just one single qubit of communication. In other words, Alice can transfer uh, two classical bits to Bob by using a quantum channel. Here, Alice will uh, be the encoder and Bob is, will be the decoder. In this scheme, Alice and Bob shared an entangled state between them. Generally, this entangled state is preferably a bell state because you know that the bell state is maximally entangled. This sharing of entangled state is at the core of superdense coding protocol. Let me explain this protocol in some details.
Elise want to send classical beats to Bob and this classical beats may be any one of these binary numbers say 00, 0 01 10 11 any of these four binary numbers Elise wants to send to Bob and Elise and Bob as per the supportance protocol they share the entangled state say a bell state say phi plus and this phi plus as you know is 1 by root 2 k 0 0 plus k 1 1 by sharing means the first qubit belongs to Elise and the second qubit belongs to Bob and here the first qubit belongs to Elise and the second qubit belongs to Bob now depending on which of the classical bits whether it is 0 0 0 1 1 0 or 1 1 Elise wants to send that to, depending on that which, which one she wants to send Elise is going to carry out certain unitary operation on her qubits say Elise wants to send the classical bits 0 0 to Bob then Elise is going to apply the unitary transformation i to her qubits and on Bob's qubit also identity operation i c is going to make that means applying identity operation means that nothing is done no experiment is done on either of the qubits anyway Bob's qubit cannot be touched by Elise and in this case if she wants to send the state 00, zero uh, classical bit 00, zero to uh, Bob then the protocol says that Elise is going to make identity operation on her qubit and because of this operation the state after the transformation will remain as it is so because it is a bell state is uh, as I said is shared by both Elise and uh, Bob and that is k 0 plus k 1 1 this is the uh, state after the transformation so let's say uh, let me denote it by psi 0 so this is the state after the transformation now if uh, the classical bits that Elise wants to send this to Bob is say 0 1 that in that case Bob is going to Elise is going to make the unitary transformation x which is basically not operation on her qubit Bob qubit remaining as it is and then the state after this transformation would become after this iterative transformation Bob's qubit uh, Elise qubit will become uh, if it is 0 initially then because of the not operation it will become 1 Bob's qubit will remain as it is and if the qubit uh, of Elise is 1 then it would become 0 and Bob qubit remaining as it is now say classical bits 1 0 is to be sent by Elise to Bob then Elise is going to make the Y gate operation on her qubit Bob's qubit remaining unchanged now a Y gate is just like a NOT gate only with some difference you know if k0 is applied at the input then Y gate makes it flips it to 1 but if uh, the input is k1 then y get flips it to 0 but with a phase change of pi so therefore a minus sign will appear now because of this y get operation the state after the transformation will get it as 1 by root 2 if Elise qubit is 0 then it will become 1 and Bob qubit remaining unchanged and if Elise qubit is 1 it will become 0 with a phase change of pi so therefore minus sign will be there and Bob's Q be remaining as it is. So this is the state we'll get uh, a, you know because of the Elise operation. Finally let's say finally let's say Elise wants to send the classical bits 1 1 to Bob then Elise is going to make Z transformation on her qubit and Z transformation is a simple operation where uh, if the input is 0 it will remain as it is at the output it will remain k0 but if the input is k1 then because of the z operation at the output one will get a change of phase only 
so this is what one will obtain so therefore uh, bec the state after this transformation would become 1 by root 2 if the state is 0 ls qubit is 0 it will remain 0 bob's qubit is anyway getting unaffected and uh, if the qubit uh, ls qubit is 1 there would be a change of uh, phase that would be a minus sign will appear here and bob's qubit will remain as it is so this is the state after the unitary transformation made by ls1 will get okay now this uh, transformed uh, qubits after Elise does her experiment or operations this state is going to be transferred to bob and after receiving the qubit uh, from Elise, bob is going to make some operation in his laboratory after bob received the qubit from Elise, he does uh, c not get operation on the entangle pair in which the first qubit which is the receive qubit is the control bit and the second qubit which bob already has is the target qubit let me remind you about the c not get operation if the here we have a control bit the first qubit is the control and the second qubit is the target if the control is zero and say the target qubit is zero then target qubit remains as it is the output would be 0 0 but if the control qubit is 1 then the target qubit gets uh, flipped so target qubit will get flipped and the output will get in this case would be just like this so this is the essence of c not get operation now in bob's laboratory suppose the received qubit is uh, psi 0 then the, uh, as a result of the operation uh, by bob c not operation the output would be 1 by root 2 in bob's uh, laboratory because the now the bob's ls qubit is now going to be control qubit so bob's qubit will remain as it is if it is zero it will zero we are just applying the c not get operation so as you can see here it would become one zero because the bob's uh, ls qubit is one so therefore uh, bob's qubit is one so it would get flipped similarly if it is zero one or the state received is uh, k psi one then the out, the resultant uh, output because of the c not operation in bob's lab will become uh, will become one one plus zero one if it is psi, psi 2 the resultant of uh, state because of the c naught operation would be k 1 1 minus 0 1 as you can see and finally if it is psi 3 then the after the c naught operation the resultant state would be k 0 0 minus k 1 0 right now this actually will result in a tensor product and we can write it in terms of the product state like this the first qubit would become 1 by root 2 k0 plus k1 the second qubit here would become 0 and if the state is psi 1 then the resultant tensor product state would be 1 by root 2 k1 plus k0 and here you will have k1 and the first qubit in this case if we get uh, this state then it would be 1 by root 2 k1 minus k0 and second qubit would be k1 and finally the first qubit in the last case would be 1 by root 2 k0 minus k1 and here it would become k0 as you can see if Bob makes a measurement of second qubits, he may get either 0 or 1. And in fact, let me make a table here regarding Bob's measurement of the second qubit. If the and the classical corresponding classical bits are 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, and Bob's measurement result 
measurement on second qubit so if classical bit is 0 0 then bob may get k0 because of its measurement on the second qubit second qubit may be k0 if it is 0 1 then the second qubit may be 1 and if it is 1 0 the second qubit measurement will result in 1 and if it is 1 1 if classical bits are 1 1 then second qubit measurement will give bob 0 so if bob gets 0 if bob gets 0 then classical bits sent by Alice if Bob gets 0 Bob gets 0 implies the classical bits may be 0 0 or 1 1 right as you can see from the table and if Bob gets the second qubit measurement result of the second qubit measurement if he gets it to be 1 get 1 then the classical bit may be 0 1 or 1 0 so clearly uh, with this uh, bob would not be able to make a definite conclusion however now as you as i have said that this first qubit and second qubit are independent and bob can make measurement on the second on the first qubit also so if bob make a uh, hadamard operation on the second qubit then he is going to get the following result that I am now going to write that in a, again in a tabular form. Say you have x uh, classical bits are 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1 and the receipt state by Bob is who is already we discussed it was say psi 0, psi 1, psi 2 and psi 3 and the first qubit uh, first qubit is after bob makes the c naught operation on the re received qubit uh, because of the c naught operation uh, it resulted in a product state first qubit and second qubit uh, we can write the first qubit was for 0 0 the first qubit was 1 by root 2 k0 plus k1 and uh, in this if it is 0 1 classical bit is 0 1 uh, then the first qubit we got was 1 by root 2 k1 plus k0 and if it is 1 0 then the first qubit was 1 by root 2 k1 minus k0 and uh, lastly if it is 1 1 then we had 1 by root 2 k0 minus k1 as the first qubit now uh, bob is going to make a measurement on the first qubit so if he makes the measurement of the first qubit hadamard operation if he make then this uh, first qubit will turn to k0 in this case and here this qubit will turn to k0 and here this qubit will turn to with a uh, sign change it will turn into 1 with a minus sign and then lastly this one will turn into k1 now let me tabulate the results of Bob's, me Bob's measurement on the first and the second qubit uh, then from here uh, from there we will be able to decide the classical bits actually you will see it very quickly so let me make the table so first of all what is the result of first qubit measurement and then the second qubit measurement by bob okay this is basically i am tabulating bob's measurement result on first and second qubit okay this is bob's measurement result now if the classical bit is zero zero received qubit by bob would be psi zero 
if it is 0 1 the received qubit would be psi 1 if it is 1 0 received qubit would be psi 2 if it is 1 1 as per the super dense protocol i'm saying received qubit by bob would be psi 3 and then he is going to make c naught operation on psi 0 psi 1 psi 2 psi 3 as a result uh, we'll get a tensor product state and then we can write it as a first qubit uh, tensor product second qubit we'll be able to separate and then he makes the measurement on the first qubit which is a hadamard operation then if first qubit measurement he makes he gets zero here zero here minus one here i'm summarizing both the tables here now and here it will one and if the second qubit measurement would be uh, just you can see we have uh, wrote it earlier yes here you see these are the second qubit measurement and if you uh, put it here you will get 0 1 uh, 1 and 0 now what you see as you can see here there is no ambiguity in arriving at the decision regarding which classical bits are sent by Ellis so if say bob gets because of his measurement first qubit and second qubit measurement first qubit he gets zero and the second qubit he gets zero then that clearly tells that the uh, classical bit is zero zero if bob gets zero one as a result of the measurement of first qubit and second qubit then classical bit is going to be simply zero one and if it is one zero then the classical bit will correspond to one zero uh, no here you have to be careful if if the uh, first qubit and second qubit bob gets is one one of course with a minus sign uh, for the first qubit then the classical bit will correspond to one zero and finally if the first qubit measurement is 1 and the second qubit measurement is 0 then the classical bit will correspond to 1 1 okay and this is the super dense coding protocol in fact the whole protocol can be represented by a scheme uh, in a schematic diagram let me show you that first of all you have to create the entangled state uh, phi plus let me we already know how this entangled state can be created we have to we have to give the input as zero zero in this quantum circuit and then after the hadamard gate it has the hadamard gate has to be followed by a, a c naught gate operation then at the output we are going to get the bell state phi plus and phi plus is 1 by root 2 k 0 0 plus k 1 1 this is the state you will get and this would be shared by both Ellis and Bob and then what Ellis does Ellis does depending on what classical bit C wants to uh, send or transmit depending on that uh, C is going to make some uh, unitary operations after doing the unitary operations the qubits uh, will be sent to Bob and then bob uh, will do a c naught operation on the received qubit now the bob now bob is going to do a c naught operation on the received qubit and this is basically means that the alice is going to send the information of her result by a quantum channel then bob receives that qubit and uh, he does the c naught operation on uh, on the received qubit and on the first qubit after he carry out the c naught operation he applies the hadamard operation on the first qubit along with his measurement on the second qubit and this will uh, able this will make uh, bob able to find out uh, what is the classical uh, two classical bits that Ellis actually sent thereby Bob will be able to decode the message of Ellis. So this is in essence the super dense protocol is. Let me stop here for today. 
In this lecture, we briefly discuss about the so-called Dwan criterion. Then we started discussing applications of quantum entanglement. And in this context, I first discussed the no cloning theorem. And I discussed uh, superdense coding as an applications of quantum entanglement. In the next lecture, we'll continue discussing applications of quantum entanglement. In particular, I will discuss the so-called quantum teleportation. So see you in the next class. Thank you.